Thank you for listening to the History of the Papacy. I'm your host, Steve. If you have any questions, comments, or feedback, you can always send me an email to my email address, steve at a2zhistorypage.com, or connect with me on social media at A2Z History. If you're interested in further supporting the show, you can actually become a member of the show. And the best thing to do on that is join us on Patreon. You will become a leader of the group. Your name will be commemorated on the history of the papacy diptychs. Now, in traditional Christianity, the diptychs is a list of bishops and popes who are commemorated during the liturgy. As a member of the history of the papacy on Patreon, you will be memorialized during each episode and YouTube video. Get on the list now by going to patreon.com forward slash history of the papacy. There are many other great benefits to joining on Patreon as well, but you want to get on the list. That's the first thing. You can learn more about this in the show notes or at the website a2zhistorypage.com. I want to thank two people today for their support. Thank you to Grant for his generous donation on PayPal, as well as some great show ideas, which you will be hearing very soon. I also want to thank our latest Patreon supporter at the Alexandria level, Christina. And with that, let us commemorate the Patreon patrons on the History of the Papacy Diptychs. We have Roberto, Joran, William, Brian, Jeffrey, and Christina at the Alexandria level, and Dapo and Paul the Magnificent. Both of them are magnificent inclusive at the Constantinople level. And reaching the ultimate power and prestige, that of the See of Rome, we have Peter the Great. Today I have a quick announcement of a couple of things that are coming up in the next few months of the podcast and the question and answer session from our live stream event over the past summer. Okay, so now for the quick announcement. Every spring, or at least in the Northern Hemisphere, I'll translate it into fall or autumn for our Southern Hemisphere friends. I usually take a few weeks of a break. I use that time to take a little break to make maple syrup in my backyard, but being that maple syrup manufacturing isn't a real big thing here in Central Texas, I'll have to pass on that. Interestingly enough, though, fun fact, there is a state park not too far away called Lost Maples. It's full of maple trees, and um, even around walking around the neighborhood, I've seen a few Norway maple trees. I'm tempted to pull out my taps again, but alas, I probably won't be able to do that anytime soon. But I also do use this um, break to work on research, writing, editing, etc. for the podcast. Now I am still taking the break which is good news, bad news, but it's really just good news because I have a full series to present to you or to bring to you uh, to fill in that break. Gary Stevens and I have been working hard on a series on the 12 minor prophets of the Old Testament. There are a ton of great stories and interesting characters to talk about. Some of the stories you will be very familiar with Others will definitely be new and probably a little shocking. After the break, I have an entirely new series planned on one of the most important eras in the entire history of the papacy. It's a point in papal history full of ups and downs, triumphs and tragedies, and huge personalities. Look out for that series to begin soon. I will also continue to release the History of the Papacy in 10 Minutes videos on YouTube. For right now, they are exclusive to YouTube, but I'm looking into some other um, platforms for that as well. And I, I really do think you're going to like these videos. I highly recommend you go over to YouTube and check them out. Uh, they're just short snippets, but they have audio and visual, and they're, they're really fun so when you're there, definitely like the videos, click subscribe, and ring the bell to get notifications when new videos are uploaded, which I do usually every other Friday afternoon. Now, if you're completely committed to audio, you can get those the a compilation of those videos in audio format if you are a member on Patreon. So think about that. 
One other thing is the Agora Day one day mini conference is coming up in April. So um, look at agora.podcastnetwork.com for more information on that and how to join. I'll be doing a little something in that it's still kind of in the works, but I do plan on participating in that event. And like I said, that's in late April. Now, I hope you enjoy this Q&A. Always send in your questions and comments and feedback because I always love to hear them. I really hope you enjoy this Q&A that I did on the live stream. If you have any questions, comments, or feedback, always send those in, and I will keep compiling them and putting out Q&A episodes. With that, I present to you another piece of the mosaic of the history of the Popes of Rome and Christian Church. The first question is, and I thought this was a really interesting one, a listener, Phil, he said, I'm seeking information about Jesus appointing Peter as the head of the church. And um, you mentioned something briefly about it. Do you have any other sources other than Matthew 16, 18? And does Eusebius or any of the other early church writers corroborate the handling handing of the church to Peter? Also, are there any other details about how Peter handed the church to Linus? I believe Peter may have been in prison at that time before he was martyred. Now, the main biblical source for Peter's appointment as the head of the church, as the Roman church sees it, is Matthew 16. And the actual power of the interpretation of that passage is, was an evolving thing. The powers of the Pope grew throughout hundreds of years of history. Basically, in that 1618 um, section of Matthew, Jesus says that you are the rock on which I built my church. And the Roman church really ran with that, saying that the rock, meaning that the successor, Peter was the successor of Jesus, who was in each pope as the successor through Peter to act to Jesus. Now, Pope Linus is really interesting. And now we're getting into more of historiography and um, how much we value and weight we put on certain texts. Pope Linus may have been mentioned in the epistle of Timothy in the canonical New Testament. Um, there's disagreement amongst even amongst the early Latin scholars if the two Linuses were the same. There's a ton of room for speculation on this one. There's three possibilities by my estimation. Peter passed the torch to a chosen successor. Maybe Peter wasn't able to participate in the decision of who his successor would be because he's already tied up in jail. Or the Christian community of Rome picked a successor to Peter, as that was really the norm for a long time until uh, the top-ranking cl clergy who would become the College of Cardinals elected the next pope. There's um, some different writings about what happened to Peter post his um, biblical career. A lot of them are written much, much later after the Gospels and after the purported time of Jesus. Um, actually, Gary Stevens in his latest episode, if you're watching this live or um, it would, you'll have to dig back a little bit if you're watching later, he goes with two epistles of Clement um, where he's in those mentioned in those. And he's also uh, mentioned in um, this story, at least, is mentioned in the Acts of Peter. The two epistles of Clement, they're not canonical books within Western or Eastern Christianity um, generally, but they are accepted by the Ethiopian, Ethiopian Orthodox as canonical. I had a really fascinating and fun email exchange that I'd like to share with a listener named Zach. And I'm going to address one point, um, one particular point that he brought up about the popularity of Arianism and non-Trinitarian Christianity. Zach posited that the Arians' focus on Christ's humanity would seemingly be more appealing to people than other ideas. And I really love this comment, and it's something that, um, you know, I've thought about in one way or the other, but when we had that back and forth, it really got me thinking about it more um, and more deeply. The humanity of Jesus was very popular to focus in on really since day one of the Jewish Christians. The Arians and even into the modern age with Unitarians, Jehovah's Witnesses, etc. I think that the Trinitarian position worked itself out because if Jesus was just a great guy, even something 
not quite God, but not quite human, he's going to get washed out and he wouldn't become the main focus of the religion, especially the way it developed. I think that he would have, especially when Islam comes to the scene, Jesus's importance wouldn't have been Jesus as a human figure would not have been as important. And I think we can see that when the when the armies of Islam, when they interacted with Trinitarian Christians, that's where they made the least amount of inroads with the upper crust of society, um, which who who would have been the ones who are most up for changing the religion. That happened with the Monophysite Christians in Egypt. That happened with the Chalcedonian Catholics in Spain where they really made huge inroads with Christian populations um, were with the Aryans of North Africa and the Aryans that were even living in Mesopotamia and Northern Arabia and much later with groups like the Bogomils, who we'll get into in other episodes. So you see, I think that the down when, the, when these groups downplayed the divinity of Jesus, they were kind of making him less important into the whole story. Now, um, another listener named Nick, he had a question to debunk a few myths of Pontius Pilate. Nick didn't specify the myths because there are plenty of them. Pontius Pilate was almost certainly a historical character. He was the person who was the Roman governor of the province of Judea well, during the time that Jesus was was um, put on trial, and he was in in the gospel accounts the person who put Jesus on trial. Now, th that's one of the facts. Another fact is that he would have been wealthy, or else he wouldn't, uh, and of the senatorial or equestrian class, and uh, probably had a decently successful military career, or else he wouldn't have been a governor of a province like Judea. And that's all about you can say about him for sure. And just about everything else you can you hear about Pontius Pilate is one of these probably myths or things that were written much after him. Some of the direct sources for the facts about um, Pontius Pilate are Philo of Alexandria, who was a contemporary Jewish philosopher. You've got the Gospels, which were written a generation or so after the times of Jesus, but probably and possibly using oral sources back to the times. And he's also mentioned in the first letter of Timothy by the Apostle Paul, um, which the letter could be what's called pseudo-epigraphal, which maybe Paul didn't actually write it and it wasn't actually written at that time. So we'll put that into another category. And then Josephus, of course, who was writing a couple of years, about a generation after the fact. We also have some archaeological evidence. Um, artifacts found in Judea with Pilatus, his Roman name, written on them. Every one of these sources has its problems and its biases. Then you have the apocryphal sources, and these were basically making up the details. Pilate is fascinating because how many times in history does a minor, middle manager, um, government kind of just not somebody who's, he's probably peaked in his uh, governorship of Judea. He's probably not going to get a bigger province. I don't think he does, at least. I don't know if that's in the record, but he's not, definitely not going to become a huge general. He's not going to become the emperor or anything like that. But so how many times do we hear about this kind of guy who is involved in an event so important that billions of people over the course of 20 centuries still remember his name today? I think that makes Pontius Pilate, Pilate pretty unique. And look for the history of the papers uh, episode of the upcoming series, History of the Papacy in 10 Minutes, on Pilate coming out very soon on YouTube for much, much more. One other thing is I've received a bunch of questions about the liturgy and music that are great, and I'm actually turning those into new episodes that will re be released soon. So keep your podcatchers and your YouTube updated. In fact, with YouTube, go and hit that subscribe button. Don't forget about Patreon, and I will definitely talk to you next time.